We will begin with introductory remarks from Bill Crystal. Bill? Fellow Republicans. <laughs> The wrong, wrong speech. Um, no, Jerry warned me that this, the audience, the, all of you might be slightly tilted the other way politically. Um, I can't say that was really a, a surprise. Um, I myself went to Harvard and uh, used to universities, and I, much as I admire universities and loved going to school and loved teaching in college, I, I know the politics aren't always what I would like, um, but I think it's better here than when I was at, went back to the Kennedy School to teach for a couple of years at Harvard. Um, at least the state has a Republican governor, and I know your district has gone back and forth between very capable Republicans and, and Democratic Congress men and women. But uh, when I went, taught at the Kennedy School, to give you a sense of politics in Cambridge, Massachusetts, um, it, it was 1984. I uh, was for Reagan for re-election uh, for the presidency. I remember voting for the Republican, running against John Kerry for the Senate. Uh, and we lived just outside Cambridge in Belmont, Massachusetts, in the 8th Congressional District of Massachusetts, which was Tip O'Neill's Congressional District. He was uh, Speaker of the House, a uh, revered figure in the Boston area, totally Democratic Congressional District. And I remember voting in November 84, and I voted for Reagan, obviously, and for the Republican candidate against, uh, running against John Kerry, actually, who ran a pretty good race, but, but lost, uh, started Kerry's ca uh, career in Washington. Uh, and I voted for the uh, opponent to Tip O'Neill, even though I knew it was, it was a hopeless race. I remember the next morning, my wife had the Boston Globe uh, at breakfast with the election returns. And I remember asking Susan, you know, just out of curiosity, how many votes did the Republican running against Tip O'Neill get? And Susan looked at the Globe and kind of looked again and said, I hate to tell you this, uh, there was no Republican running against <laughs> Tip O'Neill. <laughs> And, and I said, you, you know, I, I know I voted for someone <laughs> against, uh, against Tip. It turned out I had voted for the communist. Uh, <laughs> this is, I, I, so I'm, I, having gone through that, I, I'm happy to be here. <laughs> Much more moderate circumstances. I, um, I know I'm going to convince all of you this evening, so uh, at the end of my 15 minutes, so I do want to ask you out of courtesy to Joe, to be polite to him and pretend <laughs> he's got family here, he's an alum. You should at least pretend to agree with him to some degree uh, when, he makes, when, he makes, when he makes his remarks. Um, uh, the question is, is, Iraq and the war on terror, were we wrong? I don't think we were wrong. Um, we could still prove to be wrong, obviously, if we totally botch uh, the war and the, uh, and the post-war, if you can call it that, uh, the current situation, but I, I don't think we need to, and I don't think we will, actually, despite the difficult stretch we're, we, we're going through now. Um, let me walk back to, to, to 1990, 91, when this drama begins, as Joe Wilson remembers well, since he was our charge in Baghdad and uh, performed uh, quite heroically in, in helping liberate the hostages Saddam, the American hostages Saddam had taken at that time, and then he left Baghdad, I guess, with them, or shortly after them, and, and the war began. And as I remember well, I was in that Bush White House in January of 91. We went to war as we were entitled to and, and, and ought to have and liberated Kuwait from Saddam and then in my view uh, mistakenly and really tragically stopped short of expelling Saddam from power. Uh, we encouraged the Shia especially to rise up against Saddam. They did. Saddam slaughtered them. Uh, we stood by, uh, let him fly helicopters and he killed uh, tens of thousands of people, reestablished his tyranny and obviously uh, maintained it for the next, for the next decade. Um, that was a mistake, I think, on our part. It sent this, a signal, a very unfortunate signal, to the Arab world and to the Middle East that we had gone in to save our access to oil, which was true in part, obviously. We were worried that Saddam, having taken Kuwait, would, would continue into Saudi Arabia. Um, and that we didn't care much, actually, about the people, many of them quite brave people, who had risen up at our encouragement against uh, the tyrant and whom we had then sort of stood by and allowed to slaughter. Um, the 90s went forward, a decade of mixed results, I would say, but a decade in which actually, uh, unfortunately, the model of our standing aside and letting dictators slaughter people um, happened too often. You know, Milosevic uh, went on a rampage in the Balkans immediately after that, and I was in that Bush White House, and I'm not proud of the fact that we stood aside and said we had no dog in that fight, and it took us until 1995, December 95, when President Clinton 
finally uh, intervened in, in Bosnia and then later on in, in Kosovo. Uh, we were timid in fighting terror through the 90s. I don't think there's much dispute about that anymore. Certainly the bin Laden himself concluded after Somalia that we were a weak horse, not a strong horse. And I think we were timid in dealing with Saddam. We, we simply contained him, but we didn't do anything to liberate his people. In that context, I think the question facing the Bush administration when it came to office, and of course especially after 9-11, was what to do about Saddam. It's not as if people woke up one night and said, hey, it'll be a fun adventure to go take on Saddam. We were engaged there. We were the main proponents of the sanctions that were hurting uh, innocent Iraqis, and Saddam was siphoning off plenty of money, as we now know, for himself and, and certainly for the uh, for his regime, but the, the sanctions were having an effect. Uh, they were necessary, on the other hand, I think, to restrain his ability to use his oil revenues to uh, get his weapons of mass destruction program going again and to threaten his neighbors again. So we had a dilemma with the sanctions, and in fact, the sanctions could not have been kept on. There was huge pressure to relax them, even to remove them. Secretary of State Powell was moving towards the relaxation of the sanctions even in, in mid-2001. We were struggling in the Security Council to keep those together. Um, the choice facing the Bush administration was, I think, to really ultimately let Saddam prevail, release him from the sanctions. We weren't going to maintain no-fly zones forever. We weren't going to keep troops. Uh, it was not a healthy thing, we put it this way, to keep troops in Saudi Arabia to guard the Saudis against Saddam forever. Had its own unfortunate circumstances and consequences, rather, which we know all too well. The situation was untenable. And either the outcome was going to be a victory for Saddam or his removal. I think that is the truth. We couldn't, the, the, the containment was not, the containment of Saddam was not sustainable. The status quo was not sustainable. The Bush administration, I think, correctly judged that both on moral grounds, in terms of what we owed the people of Iraq, uh, and on geopolitical grounds, in terms of the future of the Middle East, um, it was right to go in and to liberate the people of Iraq from Saddam. And the Bush, and we did it, uh, and I think we should be proud of doing it. It was genuinely a selfless act. We get nothing out of it, you know, in any direct sense. I think it makes us safer over the medium term and the long term, but obviously we're losing lives. We've spent a huge amount of money. Um, oil prices are no lower, and no one thought they would be. Saddam was actually cheerfully willing to sell as much oil as he could uh, to, to help uh, pay for weapons and other lux and luxuries he liked on the world market. Um, it was a selfless act. Some would argue that it was an imprudent or unwise act, but I do think the motives were good, and I think actually it was a, also a prudent uh, thing to have done. Um, I think one's judgment of the prudence of this war hinges on whether one thinks the status quo in the Middle East was sustainable and defensible. If you think, as I do, and I think this was the President's core decision after 9-11, that you couldn't just accept the status quo that over the last 20 years, despite good faith efforts by American administrations of both parties, the pattern in the Middle East, the trend in the Middle East, was towards increased radicalism, increased uh, sponsoring of terrorism, both financial sponsoring, especially by the Saudis, and harboring of terrorists by various regimes in the region, the attempts to develop weapons of mass destruction, increased radicalism, increased anti-Americanism. That is the story of the Middle East in the 80s and the 90s, a story that really came home to us on 9-11. President Bush thought that cycle had to be broken. There are many ways and many uh, aspects of ways to break that cycle, and I myself would be for doing certain things that the administration hasn't done instead of, in terms of getting much tougher on the Saudis, for example, uh, and some other initiatives. But one choice we faced was the choice of what to do about Saddam. Uh, and we had no-fly zones, we had sanctions. We couldn't have sustained that forever. We didn't want to leave troops in Saudi Arabia forever. Um, and we either had to pull back, basically, and give him a victory. Um, and I think that would have had disastrous effects throughout the Middle East for the dictator to have stood up to the U.S. and to the U.N., to the world, to have prevailed, to have paid no price for slaughtering tens, actually hundreds of thousands of his citizens, uh, for us to be in retreat confirming the pattern of the 90s, uh, even after 9-11, would really have been disastrous. Other nations in the Middle East would have drawn their own conclusions. I think some of them would have decided they had to go nuclear to, to guarantee their own uh, safety, Turkey, Saudi Arabia, Egypt, you really could have had, you still could have, obviously, if we withdraw from Iraq, incidentally, an incredibly dangerous uh, 
situation in the Middle East. I mean, however unpleasant and difficult the current situation is, it has to be compared with what the alternative would have been, not with some, you know, fanciful, obviously, uh, um, uh, dream of what, of what it could have been. Uh, now, I think it's also a fair criticism of the Bush administration to say that they were surprised by how difficult the task, uh, once they won the war in three weeks, or the first phase of the war, how difficult the task of winning the second and third phases of the war would turn out to be. And there were terrible failures of planning um, and execution, I think, by the Bush administration, which I've been critical of and many others have as well. Still, I think the fundamental judgment, uh, still A, I think we can win and will win, and B, the fundamental judgment that we had to break the cycle of increased extremism and uh, terrorism and anti-Americanism coming out of the Middle East, that we had to try to put the Middle East on the path towards modernity and towards democracy, that this is not a hopeless thing to do, that the people in the Middle East are able to, if they can be freed from these dictators um, and given a, some modicum of security, which has been the great failure in the last year, if they can be given that security, they can develop representative and at least mostly democratic institutions. And I remain optimistic about that in Iraq. One of the big stories in Iraq is where all the talk by all the experts of how there'd be civil war immediately, which you see uh, Sunnis slaughtering Shia, Shia slaughtering Sunnis, the Kurds would depend, demand independence. It's not happened. It's not happened. We have a terrible security problem in Iraq because of a finite number of insurgents, especially in the Sunni triangle and a certain amount of troublemaking among the Shia funded by Iran, which we've handled foolishly. We, we, were, we let it go on too long. We, weren't, we were both not strong enough, and we didn't hand over power quickly enough uh, to those Iraqis who wanted to take responsibility for themselves. Uh, we did, it was a terrible paradox of, of not using enough force and also not handing over enough authority to the Iraqis. Uh, but with, I think, a better military strategy and a faster move towards democracy, which I think we're now going to do, um, we can win, and the Iraqi people can win, and then it will have been worthwhile. It won't magically transform the Middle East, uh, but I think it was the necessary thing to do, given the choices that were there, given the choices that were there after the decade of the 90s, after 9-11. Two quick final points. Uh, you know, people talk about Amer who is America to decide this, what about American imperialism? The fundamental problem of American foreign policy since the Cold War ended in 1989 or 1991 has not been that we've been too imperialistic, too warmongering. The problem has been the opposite. The problem has been that we stood by while people were killed in the Balkans and in Rwanda, and while terrorists established a base in Afghanistan, and while they killed Americans and we did nothing about it in Africa and on the USS Cole, and while Saddam slaughtered his people. It is theoretically possible that America will change and the American people will decide that it's a wonderful thing to send American boys and girls all over the world to fight wars. I don't think there's much support for that in this country. I think Americans are willing to fight if they think it's important for their own future and for the future of the world. I think it is in this case. Uh, but I think the notion that this somehow is, you know, once we do this, we'll be invading countries right and left is, is simply out of touch with uh, the character of America. And again, I think the fundamental problem has been a reluctance to be engaged, not an over-eagerness to do so. Final point on the president. I've been very disappointed in the last year in his management of post-war Iraq, and sometimes I wonder, and it would be a fair criticism, that one shouldn't support the war if one has, doesn't have confidence that he, his administration, is capable of managing it competently. I think they are, despite my criticism, and I'm reminded of the, the, the day before Election Day, the story about President Bush, the day before Election Day in 2000, uh, he was giving a speech on education, I think in Kentucky, on the Monday before Election Day, and he was talking about his school reform plans and No Child Left Behind and all that stuff, and he sort of said, it's very important that we improve our schools, we've got to reform the public school system. Uh, I ask uh, every American parent, the President, or then Governor Bush said, I ask each American father and mother to ask himself or herself the following question. Is our children learning? <laughs> <laughs> and it's a good question, you know. I, uh, I, ask, I ask my wife that a lot. And, uh, um, and so everyone laughed, and Bush laughed at himself and said, well, my diction, or my, if I didn't say my diction, that's kind of a complicated word, but he said, my, my, my word choice isn't always the best, but I think people know what I mean. And, and, um, and then he started to tell the story on himself. He's pretty good at this, you know, later in the day as he hopped around from airport to airport. And he would tell this, you know, is our children learning? And everyone would laugh. And at the end of the day, he told the story one last time and everyone laughed. And he sort of paused for a minute and said, you know, I found in my political career, uh, Governor Bush said, 
uh, that it's been a big advantage of mine that my opponents uh, have consistently misunderestimated me. <laughs> and I do think, and I hope, frankly, and I think, that when historians look back at this period, they will decide that President Bush's uh, critics and opponents, both at home and abroad, uh, have misunderestimated him. Thank you. My thanks to Bill Crystal, and in particular, my thanks to uh, Bill staying within the time limit. We will now hear from Ambassador Wilson. Thank you. Thank you. It's very nice to be back here in Campbell Hall, and, and to those who are sitting in the other halls, thank you very much for coming out and watching or listening to what we have to say tonight. It's a, a pleasure to welcome uh, Bill Crystal to Santa Barbara, California. Uh, we last did a debate about six weeks ago in Midland, Texas. <laughs> uh, and we had a very polite and interested and interesting audience at that debate as well. And they treated me kindly. I got out alive, <laughs> I'm pleased to say. And somebody promised to send me some cowboy boots, in fact. <laughs> I said to Bill on the way in here, if only he'd gone to school in Santa Barbara, maybe the project for the new American century would have been called Mellow Yellow, or <laughs> Everything's OK, or We Don't Need War to Get Where We Want to Go. <laughs> we can go back. To 1990 in the first Gulf War and I'm pleased to begin there having been in Baghdad and actually having been having been one of the people who was fully behind the need to back diplomacy with the credible threat of force in order to get to Saddam Hussein to do what we wanted him to do which was to leave Kuwait I lobbied hard for that I even called Al Gore in the midst of the debate on the use of force resolution, pulled him off the Senate floor for 20 minutes to explain to him why economic sanctions in and of themselves were not going to get Saddam out of Kuwait. And that if we ever hoped to push him out, to reverse the invasion of his neighboring country, we were going to have to be able, prepared to use force and that we needed to give the president the authority to do so. It was only by taking Saddam to the brink that we ever had a chance of getting him to blink. Al will tell the story, as he has, that I was the last person to speak to him before he went back on the floor of the U.S. Senate and voted with the president, one of the few Democrats to cross lines, party lines, and vote with the president for that first war. That first war was successful, people forget that it was for the first time since the Korean War that there had been a UN resolution authorizing this type of action against the sovereign government to reverse an invasion. People forget that at that time, and Bill was in the White House, the President and the Vice President, the Secretary of State and the Secretary of Defense were talking about a new world order in the aftermath of the fall of the Berlin War, Wall. A world which would be punctuated by small, violent wars which would require management by the United States and a coalition of friends and allies under the auspices of a UN resolution providing those interventions with international legal authority. If you ever hoped to get the coalition that you needed to do a war like the one we did in the first Gulf War, some 40 countries, including the army of Niger, a country with which I have more than a passing familiarity, as well as getting international financing, as the first Gulf War was essentially financed by other countries, it was imperative that you agree upon the objective before you go to war. And the more people you wanted on your side, the more defined the objective had to be. Hence, the UN resolution called for the expulsion of Saddam from Kuwait. It did not call for the invasion, conquest, and occupation of Iraq. And had we done so, we would have had our coalition partners falling off the alliance day by day. First the Russians and the Chinese, then the Arabs, then our European allies. As sure as I'm standing here. 
and any chance of replicating that experience in the future would have been lost as a consequence of our having unilaterally decided to exceed the mandate that the international community had given us. And let me remind you that the single most powerful asset the United States has is not, in fact, its military. It is American leadership. It is the ability of this country to serve as a catalyst to rally the world to do the good things and the right things. And if we hope to do it, we have to be prepared nationally to periodically summon our own political will to do so. Fast forward to this Gulf War and look at the differences. This war was sold to the United States and to the world on three essential grounds. Weapons of, the, weapons of mass destruction that posed a threat to international security and our own national security, ties to terrorism, the links between the two, and the war of liberation, the moral war that Bill spoke of. There was really only one reason for us to consider taking aggressive military action against Saddam Hussein. And that was the threat he posed to the national security of our country. It is not me who tells you that. It is the doctrine under which we constitute the military forces that we spend several hundred billion dollars a year to defend us. Our military exists to defend the United States against foreign threats. And when we send our military off to do our bidding, it is incumbent upon us as a society to understand precisely what it is we're asking them to do. Because after all, what we are telling them to do, those sons and daughters of ours who proudly wear the uniform of this country, we're asking them to die and to kill in our name. We did not have that debate in the run-up to this war. We had a debate on the threat posed by weapons of mass destruction, which was largely woven out of whole cloth. The nuclear piece, of which I know quite a bit, was as follows. We cannot wait for the smoking gun to be a mushroom cloud. How many times did you hear mushroom cloud? How many times did we see the ads from the 1964 presidential race? How many of us are old enough to remember when our parents were digging bomb shelters in the backyard? The mushroom cloud. The one weapon of mass destruction that, as Tommy Frank said in an interview not too long ago, would force us to rethink our democracy if it went off in New York City, Washington, D.C., or some other metropolitan area in the United States. Saddam Hussein was only fissile material away from a mushroom cloud. The president said in the State of the Union address, Saddam Hussein attempted to purchase aluminum rods that can be used as centrifuges to produce the fissile material that gives you the mushroom cloud. Those aluminum tubes turned out to be reverse engineering for artillery shells. And then, of course, the 16 words. Iraq is attempting to purchase significant quantities of uranium from Africa. Yellow cake uranium, the lightly processed ore that when it is put into a centrifuge, it becomes the fissile material that gives you the mushroom cloud. That was the thrust of the argument. Biological and chemical weapons are dangerous. They need careful attention. They may well need military action directed at the objective, i.e. biological laboratories, suspected sites where weapons of mass destruction might be being built. Ties to terrorism, 
We were told about Mr. Al Zarqawi, the amputee who was living up with Ansar al Islam in the north. The Ansar al Islam camp was in territory controlled by the Kurdish population, our allies. It was in territory that was within our air oversight, the Operation Northern Watch. We could have bombed it at any time. The president, after September 11th, defined terrorism that we were going to be attacking as international terrorists with a global reach, those who could reach us, those who would target us. Ansar al-Islam might have fit that, but Ansar al-Islam was in an area that out, was outside Saddam Hussein's control. Ties between the two, the possibility that Saddam Hussein might actually give the crown jewels of his national defense program, whatever weapons of mass destruction he might have, to an international terrorist group. As if this secular, megomaniacal autocrat was actually going to give up something to a group of nihilists who would no doubt use them in ways that serve their ends and not necessarily Saddam's. A group of nihilists, by the way, who had pledged enmity against the secular Saddam. And then belatedly, of course, and it doesn't show up in the 1998 letter to President Clinton or the project for the new American century, is the madman, bad man, moral war. Because there were mass graves in Iraq, and indeed there were. Saddam Hussein was a terrible tyrant. Saddam Hussein was merciless to his own population. The world is better off with Saddam Hussein not in power. It was never a question of that. The question was, what do you do? How do you do it? And why does America use our sons and daughters? $200 billion, 800 American dead so far, to put Ahmed Chalabi back in downtown Baghdad. The problem with madman, badman, humanitarian wars is that they're enormously expensive in terms of political capital. Why are they expensive? Because the minute the population that you've just liberated appears to be ungrateful, it undermines your national political will for the exercise. And when the national political will for the exercise is undermined, we revert to isolationism. And Bill is right. In the 1990s, we were way too timid. 1990 was Somalia, Black Hawk Down. 1994 was Rwanda. We could not summon the political will to intervene in Rwanda, to lead an international effort to intervene in Rwanda until 800,000 people had died of genocide. 1990 was Somalia, 1991, I guess. The mid-90s was former Yugoslavia. We could not summon the international will to react to Yugoslavia for three years after Christian Amanpour first started standing in front of concentration camps showing us what was happening in terms of ethnic cleansing in former Yugoslavia. That is a heavy political price to pay. And it is American leadership that gets taken off the board. And without American leadership, you do not have what you need in terms of incentive to go in and do these things. The Europeans couldn't do it if they wanted to. We saw that. We couldn't get anybody else. Because we didn't step up to the plate, because we couldn't step up to the plate, we were lost. And that is what is happening now, ladies and gentlemen. Because we find ourselves in a war that was not the war we were sold, we find ourselves in a madman, badman, moral war with a population that is ungrateful. We will revert to our isolationism. We will pull back. We will likely cut and run in Iraq itself and leave the Middle East, Middle East a far worse place in the short term and maybe even medium term.
and our American leadership will not be there the next time the world needs it for something for which we are well suited. We have to pick and choose our military actions. We have to take military action consistent with our own national security requirements. We use the other tools in our arsenal to depose governments if we need to. And you can compare and contrast the end of the Cold War, which occurred during the Reagan era, with what we've done in the Middle East today. Thank you. We are now going to have five-minute rebuttals in the same order, first by Bill Crystal and then by Ambassador Wilson. I will ask those of you who have written questions to please pass them to the aisles, and I will ask the ushers in the back to collect the questions and deliver them up here to the podium. I assume that, yes, there we go, okay. So uh, first, Bill Crystal. I'll be brief. I mean, I think Joe, Joe Wilson began by uh, defending the president's, pres first President Bush's decision not to remove Saddam, to go beyond what the UN resolution would have authorized in the first Gulf War. And he said that uh, every hope we had of replicating that experience of using the UN to mobilize a coalition to enforce international law and to punish dictators who invade their neighbors uh, would have been lost if we had broken the coalition and gone beyond to deal with Saddam. But then, of course, his own account of the 1990s suggests that we got no benefit from our scrupulous adherence to the UN resolution and not removing Saddam, since we, in fact, didn't mobilize under the UN an international coalition to deal with the Balk, to deal with Milosevic, to deal with Rwanda. When President Clinton went to Kosovo in 1999, he didn't, in fact, have uh, UN authority. The Russians would have vetoed it, and we, he was right to go in with NATO, uh, and he didn't worry too much uh, about UN authority. So one question here really is, what was the alternative to some form or other of the current President Bush's doctrine and his actions? And, and I think Joe's own account suggests that the preceding alternative, which sounds good, you know, we should act in, concor in concord with everyone and only with UN authorization. And we did that in 1991. We stopped short of removing Saddam. And what happened over the next decade? Did, did the UN save a lot of lives in most of these places? Uh, or not? And did we actually act as energetically? Yeah, we both agreed that we didn't, uh, as we could have. So, uh, you know, I, I, I'm perfectly willing to acknowledge that obviously one wants to act with more allies rather than less. One wants to fight wars prudently rather than imprudently. Uh, one has to pick uh, certainly very carefully the, uh, the, the times when one asks American, uh, young American men and women to go to war. But I would simply say that, the, as I said before, the status quo ante, the situation that this president inherited, was not a happy one and was particularly untenable in the Middle East. I come back to the character of the Middle East. And Bush's fundamental judgment post 9-11, which I think was right, was that you had to break the cycle of violence and terror and extremism uh, in the Middle East. Um, Saddam, given that we already were engaged in conflict with Saddam, Again, Joe mentioned that uh, um, we, we chose aggressive military action against Saddam, but we were engaged in aggressive, or at least in military action against Saddam every day with the no-fly zones and the sanctions. Um, the president, I think, was right to think that this could not be postponed forever. Uh, our information and everyone's information on weapons of mass destruction was to some degree wrong, though the threat was real, I think, and with oil revenues, he would have had the ability to rebuild these weapons, weapons he had used and had always had a deep interest in acquiring. Um, but I'm not going to defend our intelligence, and I'm not going to defend misstatements that were, that were made. Um, I still think there was a real threat, uh, and um, we have removed that threat. As Joe said, the world is better off without Saddam. Then the question becomes, despite that, have we gotten ourselves in such a mess that A, we can't sustain it, and B, the circumstances in the neighborhood, I suppose, will get even more dangerous. I, I think on B, well, let me, yeah, let me do B first. I mean, on B, I would acknowledge that the simplest hopes of some people, I don't think of most of us, but some people that, you know, you would go into Iraq and magically the whole Middle East would be immediately transformed and democratized. No one expected that. But I do think it's fair to say that um, 
uh, I think things are, the, the forces of reform and liberalization in the Middle East have been strengthened, not weakened. All the warnings about the huge uprising of the Arab street, uh, the increasing fundamentalism in countries in the Middle East really has not come true. And in fact, there is pressure on the Saudis and pressure on the, on the Egyptians, even pressure on the Syrians uh, to liberalize and to modernize. So I think we could do a better job diplomatically and politically in many of these areas, but I would say in general, despite the clumsiness and, and uh, to some degree incompetence of the way in which we've managed Iraq for the last year, I still think we at least have broken the cycle and maybe making progress in the Middle East. Can we sustain what we're doing? Yeah, I think so. I don't think we're going to cut and run. I don't think we're going to cut and run under President Bush. I don't think we would cut and run, incidentally, if, President Kerry, if Senator Kerry wins in November. Yeah, as a, <laughs> you know, just trying to scare you there, you know. <laughs> What but was it's that, good, was that it's good that you're, that's good that you're pretending to be liberal, you know, to make Joe feel good. I, it's very important to treat distinguished alum, alumni with great, uh, with, with dignity and respect. So uh, I, I accept, uh, I, I assume that's all, that's, all, that's, uh, all that you're indicating here. But the, uh, <laughs> no, if Kerry wins in November, he's not going to cut and run either. Because at the end of the day, it can, the U.S. cannot live in the world, uh, cannot let the Middle East go down the path it was going down. It's, we cannot live in a 21st century in which the Middle East is a cauldron of extremism, dictators seeking weapons of mass destruction, dictators with links to terrorist groups, dictators financing terrorist groups. Um, and that had to be broken. And I think basically the president was right in thinking that he had to make the change, however difficult uh, and however clumsily we may have managed it. Let me begin by rebutting the rebuttal. Uh, and that is to say that, of course, um, what I did say about, uh, about uh, uh, Somalia uh, and uh, Black Hawk Down sapping the political will to do either Rwanda or Yugoslavia for three years, that was Somalia, not the first Gulf War. In fact, the first Gulf War was a classic case on how you do these things. It was our inability after Somalia to summon our own leadership to serve as that catalyst for the international community to do either of the other things. We couldn't even get ourselves organized to do it, much less bring American leadership to the international community in either Rwanda or Yugoslavia until too late. So let me just make that point. Secondly, I think Bill's fundamental point in all of this is that uh, we needed to break the cycle of terrorism and violence in the Middle East, and boy, have we done that. Um, <laughs> By the vice president's admission, um, I had always assumed the president had said uh, uh, that there were tens of thousands of terrorists who had been, who had been trained in the Al-Qaeda camps. So I had assumed when he said tens of thousands, he probably meant 100,000. And if you take 100,000 terrorists and you take a, a sort of a rule of thumb of how many sympathizers and supporters you need per each terrorist, and people who do guerrilla warfare analysis can come up with a rule of thumb for guerrilla warfare. You can do the same for international terrorists. It might be 10 sympathizers and supporters for each terrorist. It might even be 10 sympathizers and 10, or 100 sympathizers sizers, and 100 supporters for uh, each, uh, each terrorist who's willing to blow himself up for the cause. If you have 100,000 terrorists, and you have a figure of 100 uh, sympathizers and supporters per terrorist, that gives you a population of 10 million people who hate you enough to support terrorist acts against you. The president, or vice president has since said that there were 20,000. So you divide by five. And that gets you the world of people who hated you enough to support terrorists before the invasion of Iraq. Now what do you have? You have what the president calls the central front on the war on terror, being, being Iraq. Dan Sinor, the president's, or the uh, Bremer spokesman, just said that again today. The central front on the war on terrorism. Before we invaded Iraq, was Iraq the central front on the war on terrorism? I don't think so. On September 12th, the world's newspapers said of the United States, we are all Americans now. When we went into Afghanistan, we had the support of 80 countries. We had the moral support of the world because we had been attacked and going after Al-Qaeda and their hosts, the Taliban, was acceptable to the rest of the world. Afghanistan had become a terrorist state. It wasn't state-sponsored terrorists, it was a terrorist state. We were well within our rights to take on that war, but all too soon we diverted right resources to a war of choice a war that had been in the project for the new American century and the strategy of this administration 
from the day it came to office, and the blueprint for which was sprung on the National Security Council within days of 9-11. And the consequences, ladies and gentlemen, are that we have gone from being a country with which the entire world sympathized and the entire world supported to a country which the world believes poses a greater threat to global security than any other phenomenon on earth. At a time when arguably, arguably, our military authority, our military power is at its peak, unrivaled. Our political and our moral authority is at its lowest point ever. Leadership, leadership by definition, means you have followers. We have no followers. Sure, we can talk about the Brits who have made a strategic decision long ago that they would be with us in every fight. And we can talk about those whose defense budgets were subsidizing so that they can be on the ground there with us. But I was in France last week and I still held out hope and Bill and I have had some agreements on this in the past on the way ahead. I held out hope that we might actually be able to elicit the support of some of our European allies. I got to France last, last week and the French foreign minister and followed by the French president said, no troops now, no troops never. The Germans said, this is not a mission for NATO. Without the internationalization of the effort in Iraq, we will always be seen as an occupier. And Iraq knows occupation. The Iraqis remember the fall of the caliphate as if it were yesterday. It occurred in 1258. They will long remember this occupation. They will not remember the liberation. They will remember the pictures of Abu Ghraib. And in the war on terrorism, we have grown the population of potential terrorists exponentially. Instead of 10 million people who hate us enough to either be terrorists or terrorist sympathizers or terrorist, super, uh, terrorist um, supporters, out of a population of 1 billion Muslims, you have to assume that a far more significant population now despises us. And out of that population will come a far greater number of 19-year-old underemployed Arab males willing to strap on bombs and blow up Americans and our allies all over. So if you believe that by going to war, by abusing force in lieu of exercising legitimate power and influence, that you're going to yield you're going to get the desired results of the emergence of an Arab middle class. Let me remind you that in revolutions, revolutionaries win. Lawyers, doctors, diplomats, golfers don't win in revolutions. Zealots win. And that is what we've unleashed. Uh, the next question then for, for Bill Crystal. Uh, again, a cluster of questions on the subject of Saudi Arabia. If we cannot allow dictators with ties to terrorism in the Middle East, why is this administration in bed with the Saudis? Well, I myself would be in favor of a much tougher policy towards Saudi Arabia, though most of the experts in the region will tell you if you do that, you know, you might have the threat of getting a really a Taliban-like regime there it would be worse. This administration has, been, has pressured the Saudis to cut down on the funding of terror, certainly more than preceding administrations did. And in fact, they have begun to cut down, partly because they're under really direct threat in a way that they didn't feel they were earlier on in the 90s. Um, you know, Saudi Arabia is a problem. It's not a, an admirable regime, and I don't think it's a sustainable regime, frankly, over five or 10 years. Um, but I think we have begun to make progress in cutting down on their funding of terror. In retrospect, over the last 20 years, allowing the Saudis to export Wahhabi Islam and to fund uh, madrasas and mosques that became incubators for terror was one of the biggest mistakes in American foreign policy. It was a totally bipartisan mistake, and it was frankly supported, or at least turned a blind eye to, I guess I should say, by large parts of the foreign policy establishment, right and left, 
Uh, people didn't realize the gravity of what the Saudis were doing to Islam around the world, Indonesia, Malaysia, elsewhere in the Arab world, um, and we're paying a terrible price for that. And I myself might be more aggressive in dealing with the Saudis now, but I, you know, I don't think it's clear that the, I think the administration has done some things. And this is an area where if Senator Kerry wants to be tougher on the Saudis than President Bush, I, I'd be happy to see that. Okay, moving on then to another question for Ambassador Wilson. You've spoken, of course, of the damage done to American leadership in the world, the legitimacy of America's leadership uh, and reputation. Um, the question, uh, uh, repeated, uh, one version of a repeated question, what can be done to repair our standing in the Middle East specifically and the world in general? What can we do about it? We'll vote in November. My, um, he, did, he didn't say to vote for whom. My, my, my judgment on this is that, uh, is that this administration has, has really very little credibility internationally and that, uh, and that uh, in the absence of the administration making wholesale changes itself, which is clear it's not doing, uh, that it is up to the voters to act. Uh, I think that there still is um, a desire on the part of the world uh, that the United States resume its, uh, its place at the, at the head of the international community, that we in fact become a source for, of leadership, uh, and that we in fact um, uh, reach out and, uh, and um, elicit the views and elicit the support of others. Uh, but it requires a certain amount of uh, willingness to heed the views of others, uh, which this administration has, uh, has demonstrated um, uh, an absolute inability and unwillingness to do. Um, uh, President Kerry <coughs> um, has said that when he's elected, he will, uh, within the first 100 days, convene a summit um, at the United Nations, and, uh, and he, will, um, he will do everything he can to make sure that the rest of the world understands that we do believe in a system of collective security, uh, that we do want to be leaders, and we do want to exercise our leadership responsibility and the, uh, responsibly and that we do want to, um, to replace the abuse of force with the legitimate exercise of power and influence as befits a great nation that historically has served as a beacon, or as President Reagan used to say, the city on the hill for the rest of the world. Thank you, please. Thank you. Can I? Uh, yes. Uh, yeah. Look, I'm all for being a city on the hill, but I'm also for dealing seriously <clears throat> in the real world with real problems, real regimes that are developing real weapons as, as Iran is, as North Korea is. There we need to have leadership, and we have shown leadership. I think there's all this vague talk about the failure of international cooperation, but I haven't heard a single thing that John Kerry, for example, would do that Bush wouldn't do. The proliferation security initiative, we're working with 12 countries to stop stuff in the high seas. Iran, we're working with the Europeans to stop their nuclear program. North Korea, we're working with Japan, China, Russia. Kerry would do things slightly differently. He'll convene the summit at the United Nations. And within two days of the summit beginning, it'll turn out, guess what? We have a different view of the world from the French and the Germans. We have a different sense of the threat out there. We have different responsibilities. We're the only global power. They actually can't do anything anyway, even if they wanted to about most of these threats, because they don't have the military to back up the, 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 the threat of force. So at the end of the day, it is going to be the US role under a Democratic or Republican administration to really to lead, and really leading means working with others as much as you can, but at times not waiting on others and not allowing sort of the lowest, the slowest uh, train on the tracks, or whatever the right metaphor is here, the, the, you know, not, not, not under the slogan of collective security, uh, doing nothing. And, that's, and we had collective security in the 90s, and we had collective security with Rwanda, and we had collective security in the Balkans, and no one did anything because we wanted to make sure that we shouldn't do anything if our European friends weren't ready to do something. And I think that is not doable in the world of the 21st century. Please, please, we're running out of time. We have time for just a couple more questions, I think. Um, and the next question is for Bill Crystal. This was a rejoinder to a response from the <laughs> ambassador. Um, and uh, another cluster of questions that's come up have to do with the 800-pound gorilla that's sitting here on the stage that nobody wants to talk about with the sign on it saying OIL. So uh, 
before Bill Crystal. If there were no well, oil figure fields, out what that was, yeah. Yeah. okay. <laughs> Spelling lesson. Oh, uh, <laughs> if there were no oil fields in Iraq, would the Bush, Bush administration still have found it necessary to liberate the Iraqis? Yeah, I, we didn't. I mean, we're not going to get any more access to Iraqi oil now than we had before. Saddam was exporting oil. We had no oil issue with Saddam. We had an oil issue in 1991 when we saved Kuwait and perhaps Saudi Arabia from Saddam as we didn't feel we could leave, and I think Bush was right, the first president Bush, we couldn't let Saddam dominate such a high percentage of the world's oil supplies, which would have given him the ability to blackmail and, uh, us and others and to really have a terrible effect on the world system. But that too was not a matter of, you know, having cheap gas, it was a matter of not allowing this terrible dictator to have control over such an important resource. In this case, there was no oil problem in 1998 or 9 or 2000 or 2001. We may have been foolish to go into Iraq, Joe thinks we were, but it really wasn't driven by, by oil. I, I agree with that, actually. Um, I, I do think with respect to the first Gulf War that had it been Senegal invading Gambia for the peanut crop, we might not have responded with Norm Schwarzkopf and 500,000 American soldiers. Um, but I do think in, in, in this Gulf War, oil uh, was secondary to the strategic view of changing the dynamics of the political dynamics in the Middle East that Bill alludes to periodically. Okay, one final question now for Ambassador Wilson. Again, a cluster of questions that revolve around the relationship between the war in Iraq and the war on terror. We all have to recall that uh, the justification for the invasion of Iraq was that it was part of a larger battle against terrorism uh, that we have been in at least since 9-11, uh, 2001. So here's one representative question from this cluster, Ambassador Wilson. Hasn't the war on terror been disrupted by the war on Iraq and in fact strengthened al-Qaeda's capacity to recruit new members? Well, I think, I think it's been a terrific recruiting tool, tool for al-Qaeda. And I think these, uh, these pictures of Abu Ghraib are just, uh, are just sort of the, the, the tip of the iceberg on this. Um, yeah, I believe that uh, we have created the, out of Iraq uh, the new central front on terror. It's self-created. Uh, it wasn't there before we went in there. Now it's there. Americans are getting killed. Other people are getting killed. We've inflamed the passions of, uh, of, of the Arab world. We may not, uh, as, as Bill's quite right, we haven't seen rioting in the streets. Um, but uh, I do think that you, uh, if you go around the world, and certainly if you go to the Arab world, uh, uh, you find that, uh, that it, is, it is a much different place for Americans to be operating in. And while these countries may not, uh, may not initially um, find ways to attack us militarily or by terrorist attacks, uh, they will eventually, and they will find other ways of, of going after us, whether it's uh, um, forming a sort of economic uh, arrangements that exclude the United States, that disadvantage American businesses or otherwise. Uh, I do think that uh, the war on terror is a, is, a, is, is a very real threat that we face going forward, and it's a threat that, uh, that we have to be very serious about. And um, as, uh, as uh, Dick Clark and Randy Beers, who were two uh, terrorism experts in this White House as well as in previous White Houses, will tell you, the diversion of resources and political will from Afghanistan to Iraq has not abetted us or aided us in that war on terror. Bill Crystal? Uh, you know, I think terror was uh, emboldened by the fact, as Osama said, that we appear to be a weak horse, not a strong horse. I think Joe and I agree on this, that the pullout from Somalia in 93 was disastrous. Um, and the perception that we then were unable and unwilling to do anything in Rwanda and afterwards, and especially in response to actual terror attacks on Americans, uh, was pretty disastrous. Um, now, if we end up looking like a weaker nation as a result of Iraq, it will be bad, obviously, uh, for the war on terror. If we look uh, resolute and are resolute, um, if we continue to fight the war on terror on all fronts, which I think we are doing quite well, uh, or at least we're doing aggressively, and I hope we're doing quite well. It's so hard to judge this kind of thing. Um, no, I don't think it's going to uh, weak. I think we'll, we'll end up looking at the big picture war on terror and saying that the uh, removal of Saddam was a, uh, a positive contributor to winning this long war, which is a long war and which isn't going to be won overnight, in which there are going to be other battles, incidentally. You know, it's not going to all be done by diplomacy uh, or by uh, winning the hearts and minds of, uh, of, of, of young Arabs, much as I'm happy to do that. It's also going to have to be won by uh, killing terrorists and killing and removing dictators or curbing dictators uh, or giving incentives to dictators uh, not to support, finance, and harbor terrorists.
And finally, our speakers will have an opportunity to summarize the full breadth and depth profundity of their views in 30 seconds. <laughs> and we'll begin with Ambassador Wilson. Um, well, thank you very much. Obviously, these are, this is an important debate. This is a debate about, uh, about the foreign policy of the United States going forward. It's a debate about what drove us into war. But more importantly, I think it's an example of how we need to be better stewards in our democracy. This is a great country. It is a great and vibrant political system that we have. And we owe it to ourselves at every opportunity uh, to be engaged in these issues and to ensure that all points of view are heard and understood again before, not after, we send Americans to kill and die in our name. Thank you. Please. And a last, though I'm sure not final, word uh, from Bill Crystal. So I want to thank you for, for your courtesy and uh, for having me here at UCSB and being very uh, uh, polite, uh, even though your favorite son, uh, the most famous UCSB graduate since Kirk Douglas, is on the stage <laughs> here with me. Um, it's quite intimidating. I'm, I'm glad that I've made it through the evening. Um, I very much agree with, with Joe's last comment. I, you know, we're going to have an election, presidential election. The main issue is foreign policy. The main issue is the war on terror and the war in Iraq, and I think it should be, frankly. Uh, it's the most uh, consequential decision this president made in office, the most controversial. Um, it was debated at the time. It's certainly being debated now. He deserves to be judged on its outcome, and people, we, we deserve to have a very serious debate about whether uh, uh, you know, he was right or wrong, whether this was a terrible mistake or, or the right thing to do. And I actually think we are going to have this debate. We already are having it at many, many levels, but I think we will have it between uh, Bush and Kerry. And, um, you know, I, I will defend the Bush administration despite their various errors. I still think they've um, made fundamentally the right call on this. But we will see what happens in November. We'll, the voters will decide. But then, even if there's a new administration, as Joe knows well, I mean, there'll be interesting and fundamental choices for a Kerry administration to make, too. And I guess my prediction, I'll close with this one-sentence prediction, which is if Senator Kerry becomes president, his foreign policy will look more like George W. Bush's than some people in this room would like. <laughs>